This video is sponsored by Nebula. I have a beef to settle today, and it's about PUBG, Fortnite, and historical revisionism. No fancy intro, let's just start this shit. PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds is a battle royale shooter that released in 2017, six years from this video's upload. It features a 100 player battle and an increasingly shrinking play zone until one person or team is left standing. PUBG is one of the most influential games of the past 10 years, the largest reason being that it kicked off the battle royale frenzy that's led to not just every single AAA studio's take on the genre, but Fortnite, one of the most culturally dominant and successful video games of all time. Now, unlike a lot of people, I don't really have a problem with Fortnite itself, but I do have a problem with how PUBG began to be treated as Fortnite passed it in popularity. So first, let's talk about what PUBG is. PUBG is slow. Out of almost any battle royale I've seen, this game consists mainly of quiet moments. While gunfights are the actual highlights of PUBG, those are only small moments between looting, traveling, and waiting for the game to advance. While matches do run on a timer, it's only ever pressing when you're on the clear opposite of the map or near the end of the game, leaving plenty of space for... silence. The game, like most shooters, doesn't have any music during the gameplay itself, leaving room for sound to be a key component in gunfights. However, while many games have sound act almost intimately, being something you listen closely to and many times giving you mere milliseconds to prepare, sound in PUBG is this roaring warning siren. While traveling can be slow and occasionally tedious, just watching someone else do it doesn't give you the whole experience. Your time spent traveling is focused on scanning the horizon line, listening for sound cues, choosing where to go, darting from cover to cover. Gameplay is blanketed by this heavy feeling of paranoia, like you could be shot at any moment because most times you very well could. While you are constantly searching for others, so is everybody else, and a quiet moment can be suddenly ripped to shreds in an instant if you're not the first to the draw. And also, guns sound fucking terrifying in this game. They're so loud, so much louder than any other sound in the game, it's ridiculous. It reminds me strangely of Five Nights at Freddy's 4, where you need the game to be loud enough to hear the breathing noises, but the louder it is, the worse the jump scares will be. And honestly, this game has scared me far more than any horror game could. While danger is kind of a binary thing in this game, you're either in a gunfight or you're not, the perceived danger goes higher and higher the smaller the circle gets. You go from sprinting in empty fields without blinking to being terrified to peek your head out unnecessarily. As easy as it is to make some little video shitting on the game because you don't care about it, the tension and enjoyment of PUBG comes with truly wanting to be the last one standing. It makes every moment, quiet to loud, have a tension to it that I just don't get in most games. The game is also d uh, heterogeneous? Okay, small tangent. In chemistry class in high school, I learned about a concept called homogeneity and heterogeneity. Basically, if something is homogeneous, it means that when you mix all the ingredients of a recipe together, the individual elements all sort of perfectly mix into this new thing. So if you look at it or taste it or anything, it's impossible to witness all the individual parts. Instead of sugar and water, it's sugar water. If something is heterogeneous though, no matter how much you try to mix it all together, its parts, its sections will be easily visible and present on their own. Oil and water never becomes oil water. These days, it feels to me like most competitive multiplayer games are homogenous. They want to give you a consistent feeling of enjoyment at any given moment, having every piece of the game sort of broken down into bite-sized bits that you can consume easily. PUBG, in contrast, is chunky salsa. Every part of one singular game of PUBG is intensely separated from each other. You're traveling or in a fight or looting, you're at individual notable locations and following distinct tactical decisions. Hide in this house, head to that hill, keep an eye towards the blue to catch any stragglers. Every part of the game, even the more quote unquote boring ones, are distinct and turn every match into its own little narrative of decision making. This is a game composed of scenes, and I like that feeling. The slow moments make the exciting ones more impactful. The stress of the exciting moments can make the boring ones even somewhat peaceful. It's swimming in the breath you take when you re-emerge from it. However, despite my enthusiasm for the game as it was, and despite the fervor for PUBG at the time of its release, the community's view began to slowly shift away from this excitement. When tracking the progression of Battleground's design philosophy, the most damning view is through the design of its maps. Erangel, the first and only map present at release, is a microcosm of the way the entire game is designed. To simplify things greatly, Erangel is constructed of hot spots, medium spots, and cold spots. Despite there being 20 or so named locations, their popularity is wildly different, and not just based on something as simple as closest to the center of the map. Locations like Prison or Sosnovka Military Base were some of the hottest spots in the entire game, beating out the more traditional townscapes of Razhok and Yasnaya Polyana despite them being accessible in almost every game. A surprising amount of variety was put into every location, with little touches that wildly affected how combat and travel would work both in and leading out of them. 
One of the most famous parts of Erangel is the two major bridges leading out of the military island, and not just because of the incident. Bridges all across the island are used as choke points, but the combination of the military base hotspot and the need to get to the circle in a rush right after forces a lot of players to try and hightail it through the bridges. This was such a guaranteed behavior that a whole ass niche playstyle was developed by a subset of players. From something as simple as just shooting people as they leave to creating blockades of cars to make gunning past the ambush straight up impossible. Players, me included, would also find favorite locations to reliably drop to. Mine, thanks for asking, is the shipping crates next to Georgia Pole, a location I lovingly call shipping crates. Despite not being a named location, it has surprisingly good loot spread along the tops of the aforementioned crates and inside of warehouses, and is connected to a bunch of other medium-ish spots where you can hunt down players. The gunplay is also interesting, especially in third-person mode, with the layout giving a verticality to things that doesn't exist in many other areas of the game. I also love the novelty of dropping at Zarki, being the single most outsized and isolated named location in the map. I similarly like Stalber, a set of ruins on the top of a ridiculously tall mountain. The list goes on, shooting range, shelter, quarry, unmistakable locations that each person gets a unique fondness or hatred for, and its variety giving space for many different tastes and playstyles. But among all of these, there is one location that's different than all others. One location that's not just famous, but the place responsible for the slow death of PUBG as a video game. Let's talk about school. School is a named location in Erangel. It is near the center of the map, meaning it's almost always possible to drop to. It has dense loot spawn locations and is very small and self-contained. All of these things combined means that it is the most consistently popular spot in the map by far. The second most popular is arguably Pachinki, but unlike school, it is an entire town, spread out enough and with enough cut-off sightlines to keep even large amounts of people to the more controlled and tactical combat of the game at large. School, in contrast, is a Call of Duty match. I mean, let's just tell it like it is. As much as the rest of the game's design philosophy goes directly against it, the first couple of minutes of any PUBG match at school is just a slaughter fest. And while for the best players that drop there, they can do some damage with consistency and often survive it, the vast majority of people who repeatedly drop there but wait in the lobby jump about the plane, parachute down, and then get killed within 30 seconds. And yet, simultaneously, the rush people would get for those few times where they conquered the school outdid any sort of rush people could get anywhere else in the game. It was addicting. While the rest of PUBG was measured and steady, this was nothing but dopamine. And so, for a lot of people, even the ones that left school alive, the most exciting part of the game was already over. As the game continued to be played, and as that initial fervor slowly got less overwhelming, people began to really sink their teeth in to feel that initial high again. While most AAA titles get playtested and refined and perfected before it ever reaches the general audience, PUBG was a game made by a relatively small company without the necessary resources to do that. And while that sort of origin is what made the game feel more authentic to me, it also means that when a lot of mechanics were stress tested, they kinda just snapped entirely. While optimal parachuting didn't really matter when you were dropping into a full-size town, the milliseconds of difference for dropping on the roof of school was everything. While looting could be done fairly gradually in that short grace period of safety elsewhere, in school you had to get a gun and ammo as fast as humanly possible. This video game was not designed to be decided by milliseconds, and suddenly had its entire importance placed in the niches of mechanics because of it. And the biggest issue of all of this is that, as a result of the harsh nature of the place, the people who played school non-stop were the ones that got better at the game faster than anyone else. And so, a schism started to form the community. One between the casual players and the people that I call the school bullies because I'm a cute little bitch, I guess. Because 100 people could be in a lobby, and because a lot of them dropped at school, there were normally a few people or teams in every game whose skill grew further and further apart from the average user base. In a game like Call of Duty, with constant respawns or one like CSGO with short repeating rounds, the penalty for dying was significantly less. On top of that, because death wasn't permanent in the game, you could repeat the same encounters with higher skilled players and not just occasionally win, but also potentially learn from them. In a game of PUBG, if you get hunted down by someone much better than yourself, you lost all the progress you had in the match. For people who invest their hopes in winning a game of PUBG, they might take passive approaches or go for tactical positioning like holding their spot where they can. The issue is, for the school bullies, winning the game became less and less important, compared to winning with as many kills as possible. And so, these small groups of people would end up hunting down and killing anyone who played more passively. To be clear, the school bullies weren't malicious in that way, they just had a goal that shifted from the game's intended one, and as a result, started punishing all the people who held that original goal heavily. It only took one or two school bullies per lobby to overwhelm the majority of casual players. However, the matches were not the only place where they were dominating the casual user base. 
The largest and most prominent figures in PUBG's community were YouTubers and especially live streamers. In comparison to YouTube, where videos could be edited and boiled down to their most exciting parts, live streamers had to try and maintain a minimum level of entertainment. And so, they naturally turned to school and brought all of their fans, culturally, with them. And as time went on, the pressure these people exerted on the community only got stronger and stronger. For a budding, newly popular development studio looking to keep their game fresh, Bluehole set out to release a brand new map for the game shortly after its official launch in the December of 2017. Miramar is a desert map. It has a major lack of foliage, very fast cars, and very rocky terrain. I don't know if this will make sense to anyone else, but this is a 7.62mm map. Everything feels designed to hit hard and from a distance, because this entire map is incredibly open. The lack of trees and foliage makes it so that anyone can be seen for miles, and you're given the tools to fight from that distance. The towns, along with everything else, have far more verticality to them. A lot of gameplay consists of fighting through multi-story windows and ducking from all angles. Los Leones, one of the largest cities to ever exist in PUBG, is borderline labyrinthian. You could have all 100 people drop there and have it be paced like a mostly normal match of PUBG. This map, too, has its school, being Hacienda del Patron, but the map overall feels much more equalized and positional than Erangel. Or, in shorter words, it feels like anyone has a chance to win. It's natural and adventurous and daring, it's the most hated map in the entire game. At the time it released, whether it's because people just liked Erangel more or disliked the longer distance gameplay, the map was absolutely despised and has been ever since. In my opinion though, it's because the map was new content that reinforced the original design philosophy of the game. Gunfights were long and methodical again, that sense of paranoia increased. It was harder to just aim your way out of situations where you were tactically or positionally disadvantaged. And most importantly, it wasn't quote unquote good content for streamers. As I said, the most prominent school bullies were the live streamers, whose main form of income was dropping at hotspots and then trying to kill as many people as possible if they survived afterwards. This map was antithetical to that entire philosophy. And as the talking heads of not just the school bully group, but the entire PUBG community at that point, the prevailing sentiment is that the map was boring. I disagree, like quite a lot, like extremely a lot. But with this severe backlash being made about Miramar, Bluehole finally decided to cave. And so, what immediately followed was the death of PUBG as we know it. Sanhok was the third map to release for the game, a few months after Miramar. Erangel and Miramar are both 8km by 8km, giving ample room for players to spread out before being closed back in. Sanhok is 4x4. Four four. That is one fourth of the area, with the same amount of players. Loot pools were heavily tweaked so that you often only had to loot 1-3 to three houses at most to get almost everything you need for the entire rest of the game. And the map was designed to be closer quarters than ever. Not just in area, but in sight range, with almost the entire map covered by trees and rolling hills. And on top of everything, there was not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six areas designed to be their own little version of school, and I'm being charitable here. The camps, Camp Alpha, Beta, and Charlie, are just transparently Call of Duty maps, presumably designed canonically to be training courses or paintball or something. It's an area unmistakably designed for people to shoot each other in. It's kind of funny, honestly. It was the first map to have the circle speed pick up if there were fewer people alive. It was crowded and consistent, action-packed, and utterly, utterly unapproachable for new and casual players. While there were six different schools, all overwhelmingly popular hotspots, the design philosophy was clear. The entire map was a hotspot, not just at the start, but for the entire game up until the very end. There were no quiet moments, there was no room to breathe. PUBG was fast now, and only getting faster. With this map, PUBG's culture slammed the gas pedal towards a certain critical point that is the death knell of competitive video game communities, a concept that I like to call the skill wall. This is the point in a competitive video game's existence where the average skill of the player base makes it so that it's no longer worth it for newer casual players to try and learn and play the game. For a company running a continually updating competitive multiplayer video game, this is the thing that you avoid at all costs. PUBG did a fucking speed run of it. If you ever wonder why game development studios seem to not listen to their communities, this is often a major reason. The simple truth of the matter is that the inner community for a game, the most dedicated people, have a fundamentally different view of the game and how it should be than the average player. And while each group is at odds with each other, the skilled players need the bad players to keep a game alive, while the casual players don't need the skilled ones at all. Once any new people are warded off from playing, all you have left is a condensed community that stays slowly shrinking until its inevitable death. PUBG is a game that is incredibly punishing to die in, and that's the very thing that makes it so addictive to the most skilled people. 
When you kill someone in PUBG, the fact that their game is completely over gives every kill a weight that most other games simply don't have. But in Blue Hole's attempt to keep the game alive by satisfying their most skilled, the thing they managed to kill permanently is the very thing that kept their game alive in the first place. The state of PUBG now is a relative ghost town. While the game has gotten more popular in China and other Southeast Asian countries, the motor for the game has been stalled for a long time and has simply been gliding slowly down towards the sea of oblivion. Duos is no longer a possible queue in third person mode, leaving five remaining queues in the game. There is now a casual mode, featuring 20 real players and 80 bots to try and make the game slightly more possible for newer players, regular third person mode having slightly more real people, and first person mode being near impossible to win for almost anyone but the very best players. However, if I'm being honest with myself here, what I'm wishing for PUBG to be is the thing that I honestly feel like it was never made to be. A forever game. As time has gone on in gaming culture, less and less focus has been put on making more games, but rather making games more. More content, more story, more playtime, bigger and better blockbusters. Multiplayer games too have tried hard to adopt that philosophy, but even more so than single player works. While single player games often last 100 hours minimum nowadays, multiplayer games are designed to never end. Even further, it aims to be the only means of entertainment you will ever need. Fortnite, the game eternally compared to PUBG until PUBG was just kind of forgotten, is perhaps the best game ever at doing this. While most other games have structure and rules to them, Fortnite is eternally dedicated to change. It is completely formless, adopting and absorbing any concept that would keep people playing it. And to be clear, I don't really hate this. Like, the game is fucking absurd, but it wouldn't be played by so many people if it wasn't fun, and playing the game myself a few times, it is absolutely fun. But to me, it's not fulfilling. Sure, you might have just gotten eliminated from the game, but you beat 15 challenges and got 1900 Indiana Jones tokens and a better shot at unboxing the fucking Whip and Nene. While it is very entertaining, layering feedback on feedback on feedback, the game feels weightless to me. Everything just kinda glides, it's consistent and dense and... homogenous. PUBG is a game that is rough around the edges, occasionally unsatisfying and frustrating and difficult and fucking bullshit, but it has bones. And the developer, pressed endlessly by an inner circle that only wanted more and more, decided to shatter those bones. To try and make a structured game formless, shaping it in new ways by ripping the entire thing apart. The bones would set in new, horrible ways, melding together in unnatural, ugly forms, only to be broken again and again with every new commitment to appeasement. Something called PUBG still exists, but the game died a very long time ago. Five more maps have been released since Sanhok, respawning has been added, old maps revamped and scrubbed of their original intentions. Several new currencies have been added to the shop, competitive and casual queues have been attempted to be added, but all that is left is an empty vessel of a game, rotting away while the company remains in gleeful denial of that painfully obvious fact. PUBG was dead the moment Sanhok was released. It is truly as simple as that. And yet, I can't blame anyone for this. The people dropping school weren't being malicious, it was just the way they enjoyed the game most. Blue Hole, now PUBG Studios, was just trying to keep their company afloat. The streamers and YouTubers were just trying to be entertaining. The casual players just wanted to find a game that would be more fun for them. To be honest, I like games for reasons that most people do not. I know that, but it's hard to feel that most of the time. So while PUBG did die, it really would have regardless. In the world we live in now, the games that survive are the ones that act like Fortnite. It just feels like PUBG is a game that released 5 years too late and then tried to act like it was 10 years ahead. PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds was a game that was very special to my heart. It's dead now. Now I get a lot of different video ideas, and the majority of them will simply never be made into a main channel video. They don't work with the algorithm, or they aren't substantive enough to last as long as my normal videos, etc, etc. I've already made three videos like this, covering waterfalls and games, the Rocket League YouTube community, and viral YouTube music video artists, but I can't really upload them here. But they now finally have a place to exist, thanks to the streaming service Nebula. For those who don't know, Nebula is a service composed of nearly 200 different high quality creators where you not only get ad free stuff, but brand new content both early and exclusive to it. Not just from me, but from everyone else on there. I was already a big fan of Nebula, so when they offered for me to join, I accepted immediately. Beyond just me, Nebula's recently started getting more gaming video essayists, from Jacob Geller to Game Maker's Toolkit to Resbutin, and many more. 
All three bonus videos are already uploaded to Nebula as of the release of this video, as well as all of my other videos completely ad-free. I also put the original non-fucked by copyright version of my Bo Burnham's Inside Analysis video, which has been impossible to see since it was originally uploaded. So if you enjoyed this video and this channel and want access to hundreds of other channels worth of extra content from creators I respect as well as my own stuff, use my link on screen or in the description below to join. It's $2.50 a month for like 50 times the benefit. As I said, click, you know, anywhere and the link is probably there. Anyways, I hope to see you on Nebula, and if enough people join, I will be able to stop filming my bonus videos inside of an abandoned house. Anyways, time for patrons. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters, Jared Chode, Walls to Morinville, Wicked Wannabe, Zimborg, Arkan Atlin, Brody Larson, Dankly Voidly, Edmund Dong, Essie, Great Value Gaming, Grinkle Stinkle, MF Bitch Boy, Owen, Willem, Seven Syringe, A Magic Muffin, Bestest Patron, Big Dave, Brian Jackson, Chris Gunther Zack, Connor, Gluggle Jug, Kyra, Maiden Batter, No Joke, Ribbon Aster, Bro Ramden, Rob Michael Becker, Stickman Mayhem, Ted H, Thomas Scott, and Undersea Rexy VT. Thank you again for the Patreon support. And with that all being said, thank you and have a nice day.